Problems, All right, please. so here we are. We are live. Thank you. And here we can start with today. So the last time we had a GK session, which you all remember, but it was a few days ago. Which country were we talking about? Anyone can unmute and quickly answer. Which country were we talking about? Australia. 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 Thank Australia. you. Thank you. So we were talking about Australia. And, you know, so many of the things that we know, knew about Australia, that we learned about Australia, was so different, so different from the things we know about other countries. Also very different from many of the things we know about our own country. So in a way, many things about Australia are extraordinary. Extraordinary. What do you mean by extraordinary? Ordinary. Asadharan. Extraordinary. Asadharan. Sorry? In Hindi, asadharan. Ah, asadharan. Very good. Yes, yes, yes. Because it's not ordinary is what we know, right? What every day we are used to, what we expect is ordinary. But many things about Australia are extraordinary, very different, something totally different. So do you all remember any of the things about Australia which were really different from what we are used to? Kangaroo. Kangaroo, lovely. Such a different animal. We are not what? used to animals like kangaroo, yes? Yes. So the well, kangaroo. Koala, yes, so the animals. Let's take that as one point. The animals were completely different. Anything else you'll remember which was completely different from the other countries which we have studied? You can get ready to start. You start? Yes. So I will try to remind you. I will show you the slide and then you tell me how it is different. Okay, so here we have a slide we used last time. And Australia, the country is clearly labeled. Can you all see it? You can see Australia? Yes. yes oh, thank you so yes, much. So Australia is a continent and a country. Am I right? Yes. And that is what makes Australia so different. All other countries are part of some continent, but Australia is the only country which is also a continent. First point why it is extraordinary. Second point, Australia is in which hemisphere? Southern hemisphere. Thank southern you. Southern hemisphere. Very good. It's southern. in the southern, southern hemisphere. Very good. And all the countries we've studied up till now are in which hemisphere? Southern hemisphere. No, all the other countries southern hemisphere. were in the northern hemisphere. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. All the other countries were in the northern hemisphere. In fact, when you look at this map, you can see there is much more land in the northern hemisphere. Am I right about that? Much more. The whole of Asia, the whole of Europe, the whole of North America, more than half of Africa some part of South America, all these are in the Northern, very little land in the Southern hemisphere. Am I correct? Yes or no? You get yes. my point? Yes. yes. Good. Thank you. Yes, so yes. Australia is in the Southern hemisphere. So not only is it a country which is a continent, it is also a country and a continent in the Southern hemisphere, which is also very unusual. Next slide, please. Now, Australia, here is the flag that we saw, but we saw in the corner of the Australian flag is a flag of some other country. Which England. other country? England. England, England. thank England. you so much. And why? And below that, we have written something, and that is called constitutional monarchy, correct? And you know what a constitutional monarchy is. Anybody wants to tell me anything about constitutional monarchy? Even a single word. Go government ru ruling. Government rules. What do you mean by monarchy? They have a constitution. That is constitution. Right? 
monarchy king. they have a king thank you so much so they either have a king or a queen they either have a king or a queen right so imagine australia is an independent country is an independent country but it has a queen who is not their own queen some other country's queen is acting like spin thank you lovely next yeah, slide please. very good well done guys they have queen elizabeth who they recognize as their monarch or queen monarch means king or queen okay they, so imagine an independent country accepting some other country's head as their head okay of course you know that this head really can't make any laws or it is just to signify it is a it is a, a symbol of the country it is a symbol of the unity of the people right and one more question i'm going to ask you why do they have this close bond with the uk and with the queen or king because, of the uk yes england also um yeah what is that sir yes what's the word rule rule over the australia well done england also ruled over australia australia was a dash of the uk what was it it was a colony word. well done colony superb so don't tell me you don't remember you remember a lot i love it thank you thank you thank you australia was also a colony of the uk well done okay so we saw all these things which make australia extraordinary or different next slide please and this is the next slide which you already you've sydney seen this opera picture house. sydney opera house 10 on 10 so good it look at their building so different from the buildings which we see in most other places the sydney opera house lovely and at the back of that is a famous bridge uh one minute sydney it's okay if you don't remember the full name sydney harbour bridge yeah okay? sydney harbour yeah superb sydney harbour bridge well done and next slide please here we go thank you ajmer for telling us that the animals in australia are different and these animals please type marsupials the animals which have joeys or their babies are called joeys and they have a pouch what are these animals called does anybody remember starting with an m such animals are called mar marsupials marsupials well done and look in the chat box please to remind yourself they are called marsupials next slide please and even the birds in australia are so different these birds are look at the slide it says flightless birds what do you mean by flightless yeah old and nice beg your pardon yeah they, can they can't fly they, they can't fly thank you can't so much fly. they can't fly they are very very big very very heavy in fact some of them are as heavy as me and they obviously therefore can't fly they are flightless birds so all the things we saw all these things we saw about australia make australia so different from the countries we are used to make australia extraordinary and today i'm going to do something which is even more fabulous about australia something totally different which i for instance have never seen before okay So this is a feature of Australia which is called Australia's hidden treasure hidden treasure you know what hidden means na what is the meaning of hidden you can't find it right hidden treasure can i have the next slide please australia's hidden treasure and as you can see this australia's hidden treasure is on the east side of australia it's not on the continent it's just off the coast of the continent of australia off the east coast and it extends for 200 kilometers 
Acha, but why is it hidden? Hidden because it is underwater. What do you mean underwater? What do we mean by underwater? Pani ke andar. Thank under you. Underwater surface. Exactly. It's just under the water. Okay. It is not deep down, but it is just under the water. So here, an underwater city. You can call it an underwater city of two hundred kilometers, which is not a normal city made out of buildings, which are made out of cement, and which are made out of bricks. No, it is made out of living things. This underwater city, this hidden treasure of Australia, is made out of living things, living <laughs> organisms. Plants and animals, which have been growing for the last twenty thousand years, twenty thousand years, this underwater city, made by nature, has been growing. Next slide, please. So here are some pictures of that fabulous hidden treasure. Off the coast of Australia, on the eastern side, called the Great Barrier Reef. All right, and just look at it. How do you find these pictures? Tell me, do you like them? Yes. Yes. What do you like about them? The colors of the colors. Well. I agree. The colors are just fantastic. Have you seen anything like this before? No. No, it is amazing. It is something extraordinary, something that we've never seen before. And these are called corals. Okay, so these corals grow in this area of Australia, just under the water. They are hidden. If you go from the top, you can't see anything. When you go just slightly below the water, even slightly, one or two feet. You can start seeing these beautiful corals, different, many, many different types of corals growing in many, many different shapes, sizes, big, small, different types of colors. So this is a fantastic thing, and I want to explain to you how these corals are formed. Okay, now this is just slightly complicated, but if you pay attention, I'm sure you're going to get it in a minute. So these corals are actually animals. All right, this is what is so fantastic about them. They are actually animals, and they are just multicellular. You can try. What is multicellular? One cell, unicellular. More, more, more than one, one cell. cell. Thank you. More than one cell. So these teeny tiny animals are multicellular. They are just very soft. They are soft tissue, invertebrates. Do you know what is an invertebrate compared to a vertebrate? They don't have a, uh, bones. Yes, clever boy. They don't have that backbone, our vertebrae, our spine, and the back which is holding us straight. They don't have that bone. So they are animals. They are multicellular. They have soft tissue. They are invertebrates. They don't have strong bones to pull them up and give them shape. So because they are animals, they do. Everything that animals do, they eat, they breathe, and they reproduce. They eat. Everybody knows the meaning of eating, right? They respire, which is the respiration. They breathe, and they reproduce. They have more and more corals, right? From one coral, you get more corals. So. Let's say, yeah. What do they eat? So the corals eat the small little organisms which are floating around them. All right, they eat these small floating organisms which are. So they eat. That's one of the things that they eat. 
they breathe so all animals breathe in what gas and give out what gas you do respiration we breathe in carbon dioxide we breathe in carbon dioxide oh my god oxygen oxygen thank you and we give out and we give out come on guys carbon dioxide thank you so much thank yeah thank you thank god ayush thank you for typing that out so we breathe in oxygen give out carbon dioxide similarly also the corals do the same thing because remember they are animals they may not look like animals to us but they are animals so they eat they, re they breathe and they reproduce very fast corals reproduce very very fast and they produce more and more little organisms like themselves so when you see any of these corals you're not just seeing one organism you're seeing many 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 hundreds thousands of the same one then they start forming to look like a tree to look like a branch to look like flowers to look like fans but each of these consists of hundreds and thousands of little 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 organisms because the coral is reproducing and when it re reproduces for example the parent and the baby corals are linked together by tissue they stay linked together joined together connected together which is why you see them as one big whole okay but they are actually small 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 hundreds and thousands of these little corals or coral polyps which are attached together coral polyps attached together now these coral polyps have what are called they coral polyps have tentacles tentacles are small little like hands or legs if you like to call them which grow out and this coral helps the coral to attach itself to any rock or stone which is there right so any rock or stone which is below the surface of the earth below the surface of the water the coral polyp attaches itself to that rock or stone with the help of its little arms or legs which are called tentacles yeah it's in the chat box right so these tentacles have two jobs first job attach to the rock or stone second job as you will see in the next picture it helps to trap the small little organisms which the coral uses to eat for food next slide so this next slide looks complicated but it isn't it is now going to show you all the things which we spoke about and make it very very easy so look on the right can you go with your cursor look on the right yeah look at these yes which are being shown those are the tentacles got it like the little arms which are sticking out of the coral which help the coral to stick on to the rocks no stick on to the rocks it also helps the corals to trap their food got it tentacles near the tentacles look at mouth mouth so the little bits of food which the tentacles trap they give it inside the mouth right which goes into the gas the digestive sac below that into the digestive sac correct lovely so this part is clear okay now look further down it says limestone callus now the coral polyp also gives out carbon calcium carbonate calcium carbonate which forms like a little covering a protective covering for the coral polyp calcium carbonate is limestone it is a hard substance so it forms a protective covering to the polyp see it's all around the polyp on both sides you can see the calcium carbonate which is protecting the polyp and even when the polyp dies the calcium carbonate is a hard substance right so it remains 
it remains there. So the coral, it keeps growing. And this, what we see, these beautiful structures are the calcium carbonate, which has been formed by the coral polyp. Somebody needs to mute, please. Thank you. So this is the structure of a coral or how a coral is formed. A coral is formed by a coral polyp, which is a multicellular animal, which eats, breeds, and reproduces. Okay, those are the important things. It gives off calcium carbonate, which forms an outer covering to protect the coral. Even after the coral dies, the calcium carbonate remains. It is a hard substance and forms the coral. This forms the coral. Okay, thank you. Now, so this is the coral polyp. Now, the next part I want to tell you is this little circle that you can see to the left of the diagram with this huge word called zooxanthellae. Okay, it is called zooxanthellae. What does this mean? Believe me, I also had to do a lot of research and learning to understand this. Now, zooxanthellae are tiny, tiny plant cells, tiny, tiny plants, which live in the coral polyp. It lives in the polyp. But I said it is a plant. Okay? Did you all get me there? It is not an animal. It is a plant that lives in the coral. So, since it is a plant, somebody help me here. Since it is a plant, how do plants get their food? How do plants get their food? From soil. There is no... How do plants get their food? How do plants... Photosynthesis get... process. Thank you. Through the process Certainly. of photosynthesis. So, zooxanthellae also being a plant gets its food through a process called photosynthesis. And for photosynthesis, what are the things that the plant needs for photosynthesis? Essential for photosynthesis. Three things. Sunlight, carbon dioxide. Sunlight, carbon dioxide. Water. Water. Well done. Sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water. water. Now, okay. I told you that the corals are not very deep. They are near the surface of the water. Right? Why? So that they can get sunlight. Right? The sunlight can come into the water and the zooxanthellae can get sunlight. So first thing is done. Second thing, it needs H2O, water. If it is living in water, so it can get lots of water. Third thing it needs, what did we say? Carbon dioxide. Correct? Am I right? Yes. Following me, it needs carbon dioxide. Now, go back to the coral polyp. The coral polyp takes in oxygen and gives out Carbon Thank dioxide. you. Gives out carbon dioxide. The coral polyp breathes, takes in oxygen, gives out carbon dioxide. Zooxanthellae needs sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide, right? In order to make food for photosynthesis. Vaishnavi, you know all the answers, but you're not unmuting and telling me. I can see your lips moving. Good job. Yeah. So, the zooxanthellae lives in the coral polyp because it gets the carbon dioxide from the coral polyp, right? Mm -hmm. Which it needs to make its own food. It needs the carbon dioxide. So why does it sit in the coral polyp? To get the carbon dioxide, one. And because it gets a home, the coral gives it a home. So the zooxanthellae gets a home from the coral and it gets carbon dioxide from the coral. Now, the zooxanthellae carries out photosynthesis and creates energy. You know, all food creation is actually energy creation. And this plant 
also transfers this energy to the coral polyp. So the coral gets two sources of food. The tentacles trap these small little things which it eats through the mouth, one. Two, it gets energy from this zoanthale plants which are living inside it, okay? Sorry, it gets energy from this zoanthale plant which is living inside it. So you understand that both of them are helping each other. Did you understand that? They are both helping each other. Next slide, please. And when you have two different organisms living together, helping one another, that process is called symbiosis. This is very important. It is all there in your biology, in your botany, in your, also there in when you study your languages, because symbiosis is a process where two different organisms living close together, both get some benefit from each other. Interaction between two different organisms living close together, both benefiting from each other, right? A mutually beneficial or cooperative relationship. Cooperative, you'll understand. Two, one cooperating with the other. This one cooperating. A cooperating with B. B cooperating with A. Both benefit, right? Mutually beneficial or cooperative relationship is called symbiosis. So now in this relationship, in, the, in, the, in this relationship, the coral polyp is benefiting from the zoanthale, right? Because it's getting food from the zoanthale and the zoanthale is benefiting from the coral polyp because coral polyp is giving it a home to stay and it is giving it carbon dioxide, very important, which it needs for photosynthesis. Correct? Did you all get it? Tomorrow, if the coral dies and therefore does not give out carbon dioxide, the zoanthale will also die, right? Because the zoanthale needs that carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. Similarly, if zoanthale dies, coral polyp will also start dying because there will be no energy created during photosynthesis, which will be transferred to coral polyp, which the coral polyp uses for food. So both the organisms can't live without the other. And that is called photosynthesis. I'm so sorry, I call symbiosis. I'm so sorry. Okay, have you all understood? Tell me yes or no. Have you all understood the meaning of symbiosis? Yes, many of y'all will have read or seen this word. Yes, it's like a food chain, but this is one step more than the food chain. In the food chain, one lives off the other, but here this is both together. Both organisms are cooperating together to keep both of them alive. One cannot live without the other. Now, supposing I give you a very simple example, okay, of Ayush and Durgeshwar, okay? Now, exams are coming and Ayush is super good in maths and science. And Durgeshwari, as we know, doesn't like science and maths. But she is super good in languages and super good in history geography, right? Now, they have to both pass the exam. So, they come together two different organisms and help each other. Durgeshwari teaches Marathi and Hindi and a history and geography to Ayush. And Ayush teaches Durgeshwari maths and science. This is a symbiotic relationship. Closely, both of them benefit for both people. 
cooperation for both people, right? And if one person doesn't do their job, the other person will not pass the exam. So Ayush has to do his job, Durgeshwari has to do her job, and both of them together form symbiosis, which helps both of them to pass the exam. In symbiosis, both the parties have to benefit. In the food chain, only one may benefit, Ayush. If the lion eats the deer, the lion benefits, right? But in symbiosis, the polyp and the zoanthile, or Ayush and Durgeshwari, both benefit from the relationship. Am I making myself clear, please? Yes, no. Yes, One yes. doubt. Yes, Aditya So I have an example and a doubt because fungus and wood, fungus yes. lives on wood. Then yes. is, is it symbiosis? No, it's parasitic, isn't it? The fungus is eating from the wood, taking from the wood, but not giving anything to the wood. Is not okay, similarly. Thank you. thank you. Similarly, Aditya, here's another good example. For parasite, mosquito bites us and takes our blood, right? Gives us nothing in return except malaria and dengue, which we don't want. Huh? Doesn't give us anything in return. Parasitic. A parasite is one which lives off something else. Doesn't give anything back. But symbiosis, both give something back which helps both parties to live or to pass the exam. Supposing Ayush learns everything from Durgeshwari and doesn't teach her anything, he is a parasite. But if he learns something from Durgeshwari and then again helps Durgeshwari by teaching her, then it is symbiosis. Two have to work together in cooperation for the benefit of both, benefit of both part. Got it? Tell me something. Anyone else wants to discuss this further or say something more? Doesn't matter if we take five minutes more, but let's get our concepts very clear. The coral gets oxygen Somebody asked in the chat box, right? Yeah, the coral gets oxygen A from photosynthesis, right? Because remember the zoanthale takes in carbon dioxide like all plants and gives out oxygen, right? So it gets oxygen also from the zoanthale. See how codependent they are. Like, let me give you another example. Pehechan. What is the symbiosis in Pechan? On one side, we have the mentors and the teachers, and one side we have the students. Okay? Because the mentors teach the students, and the students attend the classes and give feedback to the mentors and work hard, so Pechan works. If I have a hundred teachers, but I have nobody to teach, I can't have Pechan. And if you do have a hundred students, but you have nobody to teach you, you can't manage. Correct? A mutually beneficial relationship. Each one is depending on the other one. That's symbiosis. So in Pechan, we have the group of teachers, the mentors, and the group of students, the mentees, both interacting with each other closely, both benefiting from each other. Yes? One more example of symbiosis. Thank you, Gaurav. Got it. Lovely. I'm happy if I see you all telling me that you got it. Okay? Thank you. Those who have been science students already know this. Very good. And this is not only for science because this word symbiosis will come very often when you're reading about other subjects too. Because, 
India. It is also a symbiotic relationship. I don't know if you all know, but there's a huge autonomous university in Pune, which is called symbiosis. What does it mean? Interaction between the university and students, a mutually beneficial relationship. Okay, great. So can I have the next slide, please? Here, now we're going to some fun stuff, enough science. And look at all these beautiful, beautiful fish who live in the barrier reef. Yeah, still. Beautiful, beautiful fish that live. And they've got these really cute names. Clownfish, the first one. Coral fish. Next slide, please. Surgeon fish. He's like a surgeon. And a parrot fish. Blue and green parrot fish. So you see these fish have got all the beautiful colors like the water and the corals. So they can easily hide in the corals and nobody can see them. Or the big fish which come to eat them can't see them because their colors are such that they can hide very easily amongst the corals. Next slide, please. Here we have a really, really lovely slide. This is called a seahorse. Seahorse. And we find them in the Great Barrier Reef. Something very, very different. Again, a fish that's completely extraordinary. Next slide, please. We don't have only small fish in the Great Barrier Reef. We have lots of big fish in the Great Barrier Reef. And you know these names, I'm sure. Can somebody read out these names for me, please? Whale and shark. Yes, please wait. Next slide, please. Please read. Dolphin. Yes. What's the last one? Barracuda. Right? So these are all, you can even see the barracuda eating a smaller fish. Right? So these are very big fish that also live in the Great Barrier Reef. So in the Great Barrier Reef, you have a lot of the small, little, beautiful, pretty fish which we saw, the clown fish, the surgeon fish, the parrot fish, the coral fish. And here we have also the very big fish like whale, which is the biggest, shark, dolphin, barracuda. All these also we find in the Great Barrier Reef. Okay, so the next slide, please. So the whole Great Barrier Reef is a biological community of interacting living things and their physical environment. We already used this slide when we did Africa. Do you remember? We spoke about the animals and the plants and the trees and how they are all dependent upon each other. In the same way, the whole barrier reef is a biological community of interacting. We saw how they are interacting with each other and with their physical environment. Everybody's cameras are off. So I'm just wondering that are you all there or I will fall asleep and therefore you put your cameras off so that I don't know that you are sleeping. Oh, ma'am, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Pratiksha. Makes me feel good. Sejal, you're there? You just muted. So you're. I can see that you're not asleep. Okay, yes, thank you. you. Okay, so now we're going to watch a video. And the video is lovely. It's going to also revise everything that I said, including pictures. So you don't have to, you're going to hear the whole information again with pictures. It can start the video anytime, please. And uh, so that you can see it again. And you can also see how beautiful the underwater city made by nature is. So just give us a minute, please, because playing these videos is always a bit tricky on Zoom. So this is a video of the Great Barrier Reef. It's going to tell you exactly how corals are formed again. So it's going to give you a good revision. And it's going to tell you also some other points and show you some beautiful pictures, moving pictures, which is going to make it very interesting. Hmm? Can 
you make it full screen. Can everybody see it? Yes, ma'am. Lovely. If you can't hear, please. You mute. Reefs. Their bright, vivid colors can be seen in tropical ocean waters. Beyond their brilliant appearance lies a hidden significance. Coral are animals. So they may look like colorful plants. Coral are in fact made up of tiny animals called polyps. These invertebrates range from the size of a pinhead to a bit larger than a basketball. Each polyp consists of a soft sac-like body topped by a mouth covered in stinging tentacles. To protect their soft bodies and add support, the polyps secrete limestone skeletons or calicles. Corals are mega builders. Polyp calicles connect to one another, creating a colony that acts as a single organism. As colonies grow over hundreds and thousands of years, they join with other colonies and become reefs that can grow to hundreds of miles long. The largest coral reef is Australia's Great Barrier Reef, which began growing about 20,000 years ago. Coral reefs are some of the most diverse ecosystems on Earth. Though they cover less than 1% of the ocean floor, Coral reefs are home to 25% of all marine creatures. It's been estimated that up to 2 million species inhabit coral reefs, rivaling the biodiversity of the rainforest. The reefs provide rich habitat that helps protect young fish as they grow. Coral are translucent. Reefs get their rainbow of colors from algae or zooxanthellae or tissue. Corals use their tentacles to capture some food. Most of their food comes from the algae they house. When coral becomes stressed by pollution or other factors, they evict their algae. Coral bleaching results revealing corals' white skeletons. Coral provide a window to the past. As coral grow, their limestone skeletons form layers, similar to tree rings, that vary in composition and thickness based on ocean conditions at the time, with some coral reefs growing for thousands or even millions of years Scientists can study these layers to reveal what the Earth's climate may have been like in the ancient past. Unfortunately, climate change is putting corals' future in danger, along with the millions of species that inhabit the reefs and the half billion people that rely on reef fish for food. Warming waters result in prolonged coral bleaching that kill coral reefs or leave them vulnerable to other threats. Without significant action on climate change, our oceans could lose many of their colorful reefs by the end of the century. Okay, thank you. Lovely. So you see, it revised everything that we had spoken about. Yes. Yes, lovely, thank you. And now I guess, I hope it made more sense to you. And at the end of the video, they told us about how the bleaching of the corals and why the corals are losing their color, right? And they said it was, if the waters become too warm, then the zoanthale will die. And it is the zoanthale which gives the color to the corals. Now, why is the water becoming warm? Because you know that all over our planet, there's global warming, there's climate change. You all know that, right? So because of the climate change, the waters are warming, and this is not good for the zoanthale. And when the zoanthale dies or gets ejected from the coral, the 
coral gradually loses its color. And remember, the coral needs the zoanthellae for food. So if the zoanthellae dies, gradually the corals will die. And this beautiful, beautiful underwater treasure will be lost to man forever. One more reason why we have to really pay attention to global warming and climate change on our planet, right? So when you all saw, next slide please. When you all saw the video, did you all see some people here like this? Yes or no? Yes, ma'am. Yes, you noted. So how do we know what's underwater from people who go underwater to have a look and tell us how it is? This is also a big spot. And you and I can also train and go for this. It is called scuba diving, scuba diving. So here you see two divers in the Great Barrier Reef underwater. And you can see now, you know the names of the fish and you can see the beautiful orange coral fish and all the other beautiful fish, the corals on the side. They are diving just for fun, for pleasure. It is a sport called scuba diving. And here you see how two of them are there. When we dive, there is called a buddy system. You always dive with one more person with you, always together. Because if there is an emergency, your buddy or your friend can help you to come out. Next slide, please. So when you go... Scuba diving is a sport of swimming underwater, right? Swimming underwater using a scuba. Now, when you're underwater, common sense tells you that you can't breathe, right? So if you're going to stay underwater for one or two hours, how are you going to breathe? You need what is called a scuba, which is a self-contained breathing apparatus. Breathing, you know the meaning. Apparatus, you know the meaning from your science experiments. Something that helps you to breathe under water. Next slide, please. So here we have a slide of this person, scuba diver. And these are all the various things that he needs. So let's start from the right side. He's wearing a mask over his eyes and nose. The nose is also closed because you're not breathing from the nose, okay? And not breathing from the nose. Eyes are closed. So the eyes are covered because the salt water will burn your eyes. So you can see from behind the mask. So mask. Then below that you have gloves. Hands are covered by gloves. On the feet he has fins. These long things which help him to swim. Then he's wearing a wet suit which is a suit which covers his whole body. Because sometimes it can be very cold under the water, very cold. So you wear this wet suit to protect yourself from the cold and also to protect your skin from the salt water. Because if you're there for many hours, your skin might get irritated. And the most important thing that you see is the tank, right? The tank which he carries on his back. What is in that tank? Oxygen. Oxygen, yes. yes not oxygen. Yes, oxygen and a mixture of air, which is just correct for us to breathe. We don't breathe pure oxygen, correct? We breathe the air. So the mixture of air, which we need to breathe. Thank you, Ayush. Uh, very importantly, oxygen is in that. And with the tube, you can see that the air from this tank is connected. Next slide, please to what is the mouthpiece. See the mouthpiece? Do you see the mouthpiece? It's clearly labeled. Here you can see the mask covering the eyes and the nose. You can see the mouthpiece, which is connected by a tube to the tank. So the correct amount of air comes in. The air comes in when you suck it in. You have to suck it in. Take a deep breath, pull your breath in, and the air comes in, okay? Then below that is spare mouthpiece, extra mouthpiece. Supposing your mouthpiece stops working, you can use the spare mouthpiece because understand that if your mouthpiece stops working and you stop getting air, you will die underwater. 
correct. So you need an extra mouthpiece. And then there are two little dials at the bottom, oxygen meter and depth meter. So oxygen meter is telling you how much air you have left. I have only so much air left. Now I must start returning to the land, correct? Or, and the depth meter to tell you how deep you are diving. Scuba divers can only go up to a certain depth. It's, yeah. And when you're underwater, it's very hard to understand how much inside the water you are because all the sides around you, you only see water and fish and corals. And you have no idea how much inside the water you have gone. So the depth meter and the oxygen meter vary. Now, you know, when you dive, you have to go in very slowly, very slowly, because the pressure of all this water is upon you. And when you want to come back to the surface of the water, you can't just shoot up. You can't do that because there's too much pressure, water pressure. So you have to come up very slowly. That's where you need your depth meter. Come up very, very slowly, looking at your depth meter so that your body and your lungs can adjust to the pressure and you come up very slowly. So there's a lot to be learned for scuba diving. When you go for scuba diving, you can't just wear these clothes and jump in on the first day. You have to spend one or two days learning and then only can you go. Now, Ayush asked a question. Are they not breathing through their nose? Which Ayush had said, no, they are not breathing through their nose. If they breathe in through their nose, all the water will go into the nose. The nose is covered. It is closed. You're breathing only through the mouthpiece, which is in your mouth. Got it? And therefore, you're taking in the air from the tank. No water enters your mouth or nose. Yes, thank you, Ayush. You've got it. Thanks for the thumbs up. Next slide, please. So this is a very interesting spot called scuba diving. And now I don't have to tell you what this spot is because here comes now all the fun part of Australia again. Who is this man? Anybody knows him? Don Bradman. Any? Yes, you. but why am I showing you this Don Bradman? Why? He's from he's your grandfather's man. time, but why am I showing you? He's a, one of the best batsmen of the Australia. Yes, yeah. Akhilesh Gupta says the best batsman probably of the 20th century. Yes, Akhilesh Gupta. Yes, he is considered the best batsman of all time, not only of Australia, but of the whole world. You know that Don Bradman, this great Australian, had a batting average. Of course, please remember, in that time, we only played test cricket, right? You didn't have all these limited overs cricket, which we have now. So he was playing only test cricket. And please remember, he had a batting average of 99.9 .9 runs, innings average. That means every time Don Bradman came out to play, you could expect that on an average he would score 100 runs. Isn't that fantastic? That is truly fantastic. Okay. And Don Bradman could play all kinds everywhere and anywhere. It did not bother him whether it was hot or cold, whether he was home, whether he was on some other ground, whether he was halfway around the world, whether he had a fast bowler or a spinner or a pace bowler. or It didn't matter to him. Imagine he still could score close to 100 runs in every inning that he came out to play. So he was like this fantastic run machine. If Don Bradman came out to play, there was huge excitement. You knew that you were going to see a century. It had to happen. And do you have you ever heard you cricket enthusiasts of something called body line bowling? This was also in your grandfather's time. Body line. Anybody heard of this? Akhilesh, Ayush, ever heard of body line? So body line was a type of bowling which was started by an English bowler called Larwood. 
Yes, thank you, Akilesh. You've heard of it. So this was an English bowler called Larwood who would throw the ball in such a way that the ball, you thought, the batsman thought the ball was going to hit him. So the batsman got frightened and moved out of the way. He moved out of the way. But the ball went straight onto the stumps, hit the stumps, and the batsman would be out. This was called body line. And when Larwood started bowling body line, the cricketers were really worried. But there was only one cricketer who could face body line and could actually hit Larwood's ball. And that was Don Bradman, which also is the reason why he is considered one of the greatest cricketers of all time. He would step back so he would not get hit and he would pick up his bat into the air and he would hit the ball really hard. So the ball would not make him out and would not injure him. So Don Bradman, greatest cricketer. Yeah. Yes, please see this picture. There are no helmets, right? There is no protection on the body in any way. This is very, very many years ago in your grandparents' time. Yeah, this is how they played. Only test cricket. Next picture, please. And on the next slide, you guys are going to tell me who these people are. Come on. The greatest of... Shane yes? Vaughan. Shane Vaughan, yes. Tell me more. Legendary leg spinner. Sorry? Legendary leg spinner. Yes, legendary spinner, bowler. Fantastic. Yeah. Leg, spinner. Then? leg spinner. Yes, leg spin. The way he bowled... You thought you just left the ball because you thought it was going to go wide, but actually it was not, right? Okay, who else is here in this picture, in the slide? Sachin Tendulkar and Ricky yeah. Ponting. Yeah, Ricky Ponting. Ricky Ponting. Ponting. Yes. yes, Ponting. And who's the third person? Brett. Yeah, well done, Achilles. Achilles knows his cricket better than he knows his chemistry, that's for sure. Bradley, yeah, fantastic. And Australia won the four, uh, World Cup four times in a row. You know, the Cricket World Cup with yes. these guys playing. And you know that uh, Ricky Ponting is also a coach today for one of our IPL teams. Delhi Capitals. Yeah. Delhi, Delhi Capitals. Capitals. I, yeah. And before that, it was Mumbai Indians, right? Because not only is a great batsman, but he's a super fielder. Right. And he's also been the fielding coach of Mumbai Indians in the past. So here we have, and you can see it, that cricket is the greatest sport of Australia, right? As it is in India. And, you know, they play a lot of sports, but cricketing is obviously number one. And why is cricket number one? Again, quickly remind me. Because? England. Yeah, of England. Lovely. Next slide, please. And the next slide, we are going to talk about the Olympics. Do you know that twice, the two times, the Olympics have been hosted in Australia? Once in Melbourne, as you can see from the green logo on your left, and once in Sydney, as you can see in the next logo. Next slide, please. And Australians, I'm sorry, and Australians have had plenty and plenty of medals during the Olympics. In fact, do you know that Australia has won 152 gold medals? It has won 168 silver medals and 512 bronze medals. I don't need you to remember these numbers. It's just to tell you how many medals they have won. Australia is a great sporting nation. It has a great sporting culture. When people want entertainment, they go to the beach to play. They go to the cricket fields to play. So Australia has most of its medals in swimming, because you know it has such a big coastline, in sailing, in athletics, cycling, rowing. So Australia has lots and lots of medals in many Olympic disciplines because Australians themselves are very sporty. They also have a lot of importance to sports. The government gives a lot of importance to sports and the government has built 
a huge amount of sport infrastructure in Australia. What do we mean by sport infrastructure? Can anybody help me there? What do we mean when we say sport infrastructure? The government spend more uh, money to, to, yes. to develop sports. Very, very good. The government spends a lot of money to develop sports. And can you, for example, tell me what could the government possibly build to develop sports? Some examples. Come on, everybody. Unmute and speak. Come on, this is a very simple question. What could the government possibly build to develop sports? Yes? Anyone in the chat? Play yes? Playgrounds. Playgrounds, very good example. Playgrounds, what else? The hotel management. Hotel for the yes. For the players who are playing. Okay, when the players go visiting. Okay, but what other infrastructure basically for the players to traveling? Yes, but what others for the players to learn how to play well? Coaching center. Coaching centers, very good. What else? What about swimming pools? Okay, or how are you going to learn how to swim? Playgrounds for every school. Lots of grounds. Yes, safety. Safety. Health and safety of the player is very important. We are not only talking about the Olympic level player. How do you become a great player? Become a great player when you from school and from childhood, you have the facilities to learn, right? So when every school the government gives, sports should be started from school. Yes, I wish. When the school has a playground, when the school has a swimming pool, when the school has a basketball court and a cricket pitch and a tennis court, then only will the school children learn how to play, correct? You can't learn sports when you're already an adult. Yes, you can learn for your enjoyment, but not to compete on an international level. These children are learning since they are very, very young. They are learning swimming and tennis and football and rugby and uh, cricket and all the sports that are available in Australia. Which is why building sports infrastructure in schools and colleges is so, so very important. And this is what the Australian government has been doing for many years. And therefore, we can see the fantastic results which they have in the Olympics. We can see the fantastic results which they have all over in cricket. And the next slide, please. You can see the fantastic results which they have in tennis. What is AO, the Australian Open? The Australian Open is one of the four most important tennis tournaments in the world. Four most important tennis tournaments in the world called the Grand Slam. Gr yes, there is lawn tennis, Akhilesh. And there's also playing on clay, two types of tennis, right? So four greatest international tennis championships. One is the Australian Open. Do you all know the names of the others? Think. Do you all know the names of the others? That's okay. Do you all know the names of the other Grand Slam tournaments? Anybody try? Do you all know? One is the US Open played at Flushing Meadows. One Australia. is the yes, one is the Australian Open, which is written here. AO Australian Open. One is the US Open. One is the French Open, which just finished a few days ago this year, where Rafael Nadal beat Djokovic. Mm -hmm. And the fourth one is played in the UK. It starts with the word letter W. Anybody knows the name of this tennis tournament? Wim. Anybody knows the name? Wimbledon. Wimbledon. Well done. Thank you, Wimbledon. So these four tournaments make up the Grand Slam. Okay. And it's very rare that one, one player wins all of them. I mean, you have to be as great as Federer. 
or Serena Williams to win all of them in the same year. Okay, so the Australian Open, the French Open, US Open, and Wimbledon are the four great tennis tournaments in the world calling, called the Grand Slam. And we have Australians playing in all of them every year. Next slide, please. And here is a beautiful picture of the Australian Open Tennis Stadium, which here you see the center court. And here you see all the spectators, the people who have come to watch the Australian Open. Okay, it's a fabulous picture. It's in Melbourne. That's the last picture. Yeah, look at that picture again to understand how Australia has built sports infrastructure, tennis courts all the stadiums for two Olympics, right? Now these are places where youngsters can train for further Olympics. So look at the sports infrastructure. Australia is a great sporting nation and has a culture of sports. On Sundays, we want to go to our friends, to our relatives' homes and visit them. We want to eat, we want to go to movies. Yes, they also want to do that. But they also want to go out in the open and play. They want to play football and volleyball and cricket and rugby and swim in the sea. So they have a culture of this is what they enjoy and this is what they want for their entertainment. And therefore, they produce a lot of great sportsmen. And that's where I'm going to stop with a very other. Last time also, we stopped with this very cute video of the kookaburra. And this time, we're going to stop with a little clip from this movie called Finding Nemo. You can get it set up. The movie is called Finding Nemo. It's made for children. It's a cartoon type movie and you can download it and watch it anytime. It's a lovely movie. The whole family can watch it together. So do watch it if you get the time. And here we're going to show you a little yes, clip from the movie Finding Nemo. Hello. Don't be rude. Say hi. Huh. Hello. His son, Bingo, Nemo. Nemo, was taken to uh, Sydney. Yes. And it's really, really important that we get there as fast as we can. So can you help us out? Come on, little fella. Come on. Dory, I'm a little fella. I don't think that's a little fella. Oh, 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 big fella. Big fe whale. Okay. Maybe he only speaks whale. We need uh, Dory. to find his What are you doing? Are you, are you sure you speak whale? Can you give us Dory? Heaven knows what you're saying. See, he's swimming away. Come back. He's not coming back. We offended him. Maybe a different dialect. Dory. Dory, this is not whale. You're speaking like upset stomach. Maybe I should try humpback. No, don't try humpback. Whoa. All right. Whoa. You actually sound sick. Maybe louder, huh? Don't do that. Too much orca. Didn't it sound a little orca-ish? It doesn't sound orca. It sounds like nothing I've ever heard. No. It's just as well. He might be hungry. Don't worry. Whales don't eat clownfish. They eat krill. Oh, look, Krill! Okay, so here's, so here's the clownfish, as you saw, and the surgeon fish. And the clownfish is the daddy, and his son is lost, right? And his son's name yes. is Nemo. Yeah. So they've gone to look for Nemo. So they're finding Nemo. So they see this big, huge whale and they get really frightened, but they want to ask him, hey, have you seen his son? Because we are looking for his son. So this is a really cute movie in cartoons. It's underwater. It's animated. It's called an animated movie. And if you like it, please do download and watch it whenever you are free. Okay, guys, with this, we're going to stop our... 
uh, Australia part two for today. Thank you very, very much, everybody. I know the oral polyps and the symbiosis was a little hard, but it's important that every time we learn something new, which can add to our knowledge. All right, it's lovely. GK is fantastic, but we always need to learn some new concept or something which adds to our knowledge base. If you feel this was complicated and you would like to redo the symbiosis part, we can definitely redo it at some other time. Or I can find other examples of symbiosis and we can use them so that we understand the concept very clearly. Thank you very much. Please do remember to try and fill your Google form. I promise you, I will make it very simple. All right? Do try. It will make you remember. It will help you to remember. If you want to be reminded, you may also go back on YouTube and re-watch the class. Thank you very, very much for attending. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, you very ma much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. It was lovely having you all and seeing you all.